The Bombers and the Bombed. John Shardy, an American poet. I had no attraction to the military, yet we had to go out and do something. I was terribly innocent at 26. I was the Tanglefoot civilian who did not know what he was doing. I did not want to go into the Navy. I would not under any circumstances get into a submarine. And I didn't see any point in being a foot slogger, sleeping in the mud. I had dreams of being a pilot, so I signed up as an aviation cadet. The army decided I was not pilot material. The army was right. They sent me to navigation school. I would have come out as a navigator and been sent to the 8th Air Force. As a graduate student, I had signed some petitions in favor of the Spanish loyalists. So when I came up for a graduation from the navigation school, I was classified as a PAF, a premature anti-fascist. The dice committee had wired in. I did not get a commission. A year later, I heard that all 44 men of my graduating class were either KIA or MIA, dead or missing in action. When we got to Saipan, I was a gunner on a B-29. It seemed certain to me we were not going to survive. We had to fly 35 missions. The average life of a crew was something between 6 and 8 missions. So you simply took the extra pay, took the badges, took relief from dirty details. Now pay up. There was a way out. Any man who was tired of flying could report to the squadron CO and ground himself. He would be put on permanent garbage detail. Permanent garbage detail is much better than burning to death. Yet in all the time we were there, most of a year, only two men in the whole squadron put themselves on permanent garbage detail. Not a one received any wisecracks from anybody. Everybody knew that if he dared, he'd be on that garbage truck with him. I don't think it was patriotism. I think it was a certain amount of pride. The unit was the crew. You belonged to 11 men. You're trained together. You're bound together. I was once ordered to fly in the place of a gunner who had received a shrapnel wound. I dreaded that mission. I wanted to fly with my own crew. I didn't know those other people. I didn't want to run the risk of dying with strangers. I was saved by two more flukes. The first was the dice committee. We got to Saipan in November of 44, in time to fly the first raids over Tokyo. Those were long missions. We were in the air, normally about 14 hours. Most of it was over the open Pacific. We had to get over the coast, make our bombing run, and then make it back to Saipan. We took some rather heavy losses. 65% of them, as I recall, were due to engine failures. The B-29 tended to catch fire. They finally flew the bugs out of this new plane. At one time, one of the blisters on our plane was damaged. The plexiglass bubble out of which the gunner tracked. There were no spares on the island, so we sat it out almost a month of February of 45, waiting for a replacement. During that time, we lost a lot of crews. We were out surfing, playing in the ocean, spearfishing. I would give myself at least a 40% chance of having been killed in February, except for this blister thing. Instead, it turned into a vacation. The third time was a pure fluke. I was halfway through the tour of missions. I know it was over 14. You got an air medal for surviving five missions. 
And if you survive five more... Eight more, I think, actually. You got another air medal. The next one was a DFC. I got two air medals, so I must have had 14 or 15 missions. I received orders to report to headquarters. The colonel in charge of awards and decorations said, We've run into real, pro real trouble with our program. We need somebody with combat crew experience who can write. You've taught college English. You've published a book. You're now working for me. You're going to take charge of the awards and decorations. This program was raided by the brass, so that decorations were pointless after a while. Anybody up to the grade of a captain, you may assume he earned it. Anybody from the grade of Major Up who has a high decoration may have earned it, but you don't have to believe it. Go to your squadron, the colonel said. Pick up your gear. We'll keep you on flying pay. You'll have to fly back and forth to Guam to report to the board. While you're at it, so on an extra strike. I was then a staff sergeant. I couldn't make tech for having been shot at. But I did it for grinding out words. A few missions later, the crew I had been on took a direct hit over Tokyo Bay from an unexploded flak shell. It went right through the wing gas tank, and the plane just blew up, disintegrated in midair. Just one of those flukes. That's three times I should have been absolutely dead except for the flukes I feel sorry for the kids in Vietnam they couldn't have figured out what it was they were fighting for I knew why I was there that doesn't mean I wasn't scared I don't know what I would have done in Vietnam I mean I'm a botch as a killer as a soldier, but as an American, I felt very strongly I did not want to be alive to see the Japanese impose surrender terms. On the night before a mission, you reviewed the facts. You tried to get some sleep. The army is very good at keeping you awake forever before you have a long mission. Sleep just wouldn't come to you. You get to think, by this time tomorrow, you may have been burned to death. I used to have little routines for kidding myself. Forget it, you died last week. You'd get some Dutch courage out of that. We were in the terrible business of burning out Japanese towns. That meant women, and old people, and children. One part of me, a surviving savage voice, says, I'm sorry we left any of them living. I wish we'd finished killing them all. Of course, as soon as rationality overcomes the first impulse, you say, now come on, this is the human race. Let's try to be civilized. I had to condition myself to be a killer. This was remote control. All we did was push buttons. I didn't see anybody we killed. I saw the fires we set. The first four and a half months was wasted effort. We lost all those crews for nothing. We had been trained to do precision high altitude bombing from 32,000 feet. It was all beautifully planned, except we discovered the Siberian jet stream. The winds went off all computed bomb tables. We began to get winds at 200 knots, and the bombs simply scattered all over Japan. We were hitting nothing, and losing planes. Curtis LeMay came in and changed the whole operation. He had been head of the 8th Air Force and was sent over to take on the 20th. That's the one I was in. He changed tactics. He said, go in at night, from 5,000 feet, without gunners, just a couple of rear-end observers. We'll save weight on the turrets, 
and on ammunition. The Japanese have no fighter resistance at night. They have no radar. We'll drop fire sticks. I have some of my strike photos at home. Tokyo looked like one leveled bed of ash. The only thing standing were some stone buildings. If you looked at the photos carefully, you'd say that they were gutted. Some of the people jumped into rivers to get away from these firestorms. They were packed in so tight to get away from the fire, they suffocated. They were so close to one another they couldn't fall over. It must have been horrible. I have one image of an early raid in which a Japanese fighter plane board in. I saw his goggled face as he went over the top of our plane. I got a burst into him and he was gone. I got a probable for it. After the first raid, nothing came at us from behind. The Japanese lined up across the sky and came in to ram. They would all swarm on the B-29 and finish it off. That happened from time to time. We were playing a lottery. A certain number of planes had to be lost. You were just hoping that by blind chance yours would not be. When news of the atom bomb came, we didn't know what it was. We won the lottery. Hey, we're gonna get out of here. We may survive this after all. I never had any ambition to be a warrior. I had to condition myself to sell myself against my own death. One measure of that is hatred. I did want every Japanese dead. Part of it was our own propaganda machine, but part of it was what we heard accurately. This was the enemy. We were there to eliminate them. That's the soldier's short-term bloody view. But I was never really a soldier. I was caught up in the army, a civilian putting in my service. When it was over, I had a longer view. It's anyone's universe. Anyone has as good a right to it as I have. Who am I to want to go out killing people? I think the Germans of that area were guilty. On the other hand, I think any people subjected to a propaganda barrage with their patriotic feelings worked on could become savage. When you're on a mission and you saw a Japanese plane go down, you cheered. This was a football game. When one of your guys went down, you sighed. It was miserable. One of the saddest things I ever saw when we were flying wing on a plane that got hit was the barber's chair gunner in the big bubble at the very top. He was right there beside us in plain sight beginning to go down. He just waved his hand goodbye. There was nothing you could do. You couldn't reach out to touch him. Of course that got to you. You were under a compulsion to say nice things about the guy. You saw a plane break up. You saw it catch fire. You saw two shoots, one of them burning. Whatever it was, the truth is, the dark truth, you were secretly glad it could have been you. It was a superstitious ritual we were playing. There were a certain number of black balls to be passed out. Every time another plane went down, it was taken out of play. Somebody had to catch it, and somebody else caught it for you. It didn't make any sense, but that's the way we felt. That's a dirty, dark thing to say. When we go to funerals of old friends these days, in one corner of our minds we're saying, Well, I outlived that old bastard. When the news came that 
So-and-so's crew had been hit and gone down over Tokyo. You made sounds. Oh my god. But somewhere, very deep down in your psyche is, it could have been me. My first poems of any consequence, I feel, were war poems. I'm not a war poet. But just about that time, they were beginning to come together. I found myself writing a lot of elegies for friends of mine who did not make it. Then it occurred to me that the way things were going, I might not make it. So I decided to write my own elegy just in case. He recites. Here lie Charlie's pearly bones in their ripe organic mess. Jungle blown, his chromosomes breed to a new address. Here lies the sergeant's mortal wreck, lily spiked and termite kissed, spiders pendant from his neck, and a beetle on his wrist. Bring the tick and southern flies where the land crabs run on morning. Through a night of jungle skies, to a climbless morning. And bring the chalk eraser here, fresh from rubbing out his name. Burn the crew board for a beer, also Colonel What's-His-Name. Let no dice be stored and still. Let no poker deck be torn. But pour the smuggled rye until the barracks threshold is outworn. File the papers, pack the clothes, send the coded word through air. We regret, and no one knows where the sergeant goes from here. Oleg Sakumov. It is a beautiful Sunday morning of June 22nd, 1941. The sky is clear, the day quiet. All Leningrad is in a holiday mood. It always is at this time of year. The summer solstice has begun when the sun does not set in Leningrad. Girls in their pretty dresses and young men in their white ice cream pants had been walking all night long on these streets, singing songs, their arms entwined. Suddenly, a voice on the street's loudspeaker is saying, Vinomania, Vinomania, attention, attention. Hitler has attacked and his armies have crossed the Russian border around four o'clock that morning. The siege of Leningrad was to begin on the 7th of September and go on unrelenting for 900 days. Nobody knows how many people in Leningrad died. It was surely a million. It may have been a million five. Almost half the people of the city dead. Imagine New York, New York City or Chicago with half its people dead. There were months of horror. The bones and remains of people at the end of the siege were stacked higher than buildings. In the winter, there is no light, no heat. It is 20 below zero. A slice of bread a day, bread made of sawdust and glue. There's no water, no transportation. How did people survive under those conditions? I don't know. When the radio was on, the metronome tick ticked. It was like the city's heartbeat. Without it, there was no outward sign that the city was alive. Harrison Salisbury, Reflections on a Summer Day in 1982, shortly after we visited the mass grave at Leningrad. A poet living in Leningrad. I was six when the war began. That Sunday morning, my family took me to the Pushkin Museum. After that, Everything was wiped out. What I most remember is the snow, winter, 
cold. Fog. It eats people. The houses were like dead houses. The smoke was alive. The people were dead. The smoke came from the damaged homes and the fire bombs. One hundred thousand were dropped on Leningrad. When I was seven, I spoke on the radio. I read a poem to the victory day. It was long before the victory. It was important for the soldiers at the front to hear this childish voice on the radio, to know that the children of Leningrad were alive. This was no less important than the projectiles. Later, I read my own poem about a very small, young, skinny, very hungry boy who was so small he could walk under the table. Myself, of course. The most difficult days were when my mother could not get up from bed to go to work. She was too weak from hunger. I went to the kindergarten by myself. When my steps as a man, it is not a far distance. To a man, they are snow heaps. To me, this little boy, they were snow mountains. In this silent city, there came these sudden bursts of sound, the explosions. I was very frightened, and it was such a long distance to school. We ate what you give to horses, oats. In the summer, we picked up grass, boiled it, and ate it. It was food on our minds, all the time. Morning was the best time of the day, when you get up. You think, something might turn up, you might get something to eat. All the days became one long day and night. Imagine 900 such days. It seemed forever. Victory Day? On the 9th of May, 1945, we went to a small opera theater. It was Iolante. Suddenly, the performance stopped. And the director came out and said that the Germans surrendered. Everybody in the theater went to the square. I saw hundreds of thousands of people dancing, embracing each other, tossing the soldiers in the air. They were crying and kissing each other. I was nine years old. <laughs> 